My name is Tony Caggiano. I'm the Vice President of Research and Development at Accorda Therapeutics. And uh, we're a company just outside of uh, New York, New York, um, with a mission to develop and distribute uh, therapies to improve the lives of people with neurologic disorders. And uh, our biggest success to date has been the development of Ampira, which you've heard a lot about today, which is dalfampiridine or 4 amino um, And um, what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, the background, and then Andy's going to talk a little bit about the clinical trial that's going on for an antibody that we're using to promote remyelination um, in MS. And I think this is, um, you know, a great example where, you know, MS is not the, the big bad em enemy pulling resources, but really shows how uh, these diseases are largely overlapping. And um, I was saying to Dr. Levy earlier today, when uh, someone mentioned yesterday that the, uh, his trial with uh, Ampira in uh, transverse myelitis was the first controlled uh, trial in, in TM, you know, that really made my month. Um, because indeed, you know, as physicians, as advocates, those of us in industry, you know, that's why we get up every single day is to try and uh, do a little bit to make everyone's life a little bit better or hopefully a lot better. So um, clearly I am the representative of big bad industry. So <laughs> as such, I'll start with the, the disclosures. Um, so the antibody we're gonna talk about today is purely experimental, it's not approved. Uh, no physician on the planet can prescribe it for anything. Um, and right now we're in uh, a first trial in patients with MS, which is a safety trial. So we don't have any data on whether it works in people and whether it's safe. You know, that, that's why we do the trial. So uh, keep that in mind. Secondly, um, Andy and I are both employees of Accorda. And so clearly, uh, we have all sorts of prejudices, conflicts of interest. Uh, we would just want to say right up front that, um, that we are compensated by Accorda. And then finally, much of what we're going to show today was produced by Moses Rodriguez in his lab over the last 15 years. Um, and we've been working with them. And I'm going to show you some of that data. So uh, to give you a quick overview, uh, this antibody was initially identified by Moses Rodriguez. And it's a naturally occurring antibody, which was derived from a human. Um, it binds myelin, promotes remyelination in uh, several animal models. And as such, we've uh, pursued development of this as a therapeutic for MS. So the way it was discovered was that Moses was looking for ways to make animal models of uh, MS worse. And so what he did was he uh, inoculated mice with uh, ground up spinal cord, pulled antibodies that were generated out of those mice, gave them to other antibody, I mean other mice that had animal models of MS. And to his surprise, what he found was that um, they did, the mice did better rather than worse. So he isolated these antibodies and to his surprise found that these antibodies were not normal antibodies that were raised um, after being exposed to the spinal cord uh, homogenates, but that they were naturally occurring germline antibodies. Um, so he had the hypothesis that um, you know, if these germline antibodies, meaning these are antibodies that the mice had all along, existed in mice, maybe humans have a similar kind of antibody um, that might be able to promote remyelination. So he went through and screened these, uh, these antibodies and found that some of them bind to neurons, some of them, like this one here, binds almost exclusively to the myelin uh, within, within brains. Um, so he went through his bank that exists at the Mayo of uh, hundreds of thousands of samples, um, and he looked for either IgG antibodies or IgM antibodies that will bind to central nervous system. And he found several that do. And of those, he uh, you know, reduced down to a few candidates and found some that bound myelin and some that bound uh, neurons. And of the ones that bound to myelin, what he found was that if he took those human antibodies and gave them to mice that had uh, models of MS and demyelination, he could enhance the recovery in these mice. So 
this is where the uh, recombinant human IgM22 antibody that we're developing uh, was derived. And it's nearly entirely a human antibody. All of the immunoglobulin domains, which are what bind and do the work of an antibody, are from human. And then an IgM antibody has an interesting little feature called a J chain, which keeps all the immunoglobulins together. And uh, by a step of manufacturing, when, um, when these uh, cells that make the antibody were constructed, it pulled in the J chain from, from the mouse. So it's about 99.9, like ivory. Um, a human antibody, and uh, it's got a few amino acids uh, derived from a mouse J-chain. So this is a picture of what the binding of um, the original antibody that was derived from a person, and then the antibody that's now made recombinantly. Um, and what we've seen is that this binds exclusively to central nervous system myelin, um, and uh, that holds true whether you're looking at a mouse, a rabbit, a dog, a baboon, or a uh, person. Um, and here's what it looks like when you look at uh, the binding to oligodendrocytes, which again are the, the cells that make myelin within our central nervous system. And what you can see is that um, across species, uh, it binds quite uh, nicely uh, to oligodendrocytes. So much of the work that, my, that Moses did was done in the um, Tyler's murine encephalomyelitis virus model of MS. And this is a model where mice are exposed to a particular virus which goes on to cause inflammation and demyelinating lesions within their brain and spinal cord, um, and as such is used as a model of different diseases uh, with demyelination. So here's a picture of what it looks like. So on the top is the cross-section of a spinal cord from a normal healthy mouse, and then on the right side a higher, um, a higher power look. And what you see, the white dots are the neurons running kind of in and out of the screen, cut across, and the black circles are the insulating myelin around them. Whereas in the disease model, what you see is you get these areas of demyelination where there's still uh, neurons that exist um, and have not yet been destroyed, but what they lack is the myelin um, around them. So what Moses was able to show was that in these mice, if he treated them with either the 22 antibody, which we're developing, or another antibody, which we, he calls 46, he could promote a certain degree of remyelination within those lesions. So if what you look at here is on the periphery, what you see is pretty normal, thick, healthy myelin, whereas in the center, what used to be a lesion, um, you see neurons with nice little wraps of myelin around them. Now that's not as full and thick as in a normal area, but certainly nice evidence of remyelination. So most of the studies, as I mentioned, were done in TMEV, and the mice are infected. Um, they begin to develop the disease and, and symptoms, like not being able to walk and groom themselves, lift up their tail and so forth. Then they're treated, and Moses has looked at um, uh, remyelination like this by looking at their tissue, and then also at functional recovery and some radiologic measures um, as well. And we're going to just briefly touch on some of those. So looking at all of his studies combined, what you see is that when you treat mice with this antibody compared to a control, there's a significant enhancement of areas that demonstrate um, remyelination. Um, one of the most interesting things about this antibody is that the remyelination occurs for many, many weeks. So here they looked at five weeks after treatment and 10 weeks after treatment, and that the effect is maintained even after a single treatment. So what he's shown here on the right side are areas of remyelination with a control or with a single or a double dose of the antibody, either five weeks or 10 weeks after treatment. And what you see is that there's a similar level of remyelination whether treated once or twice. It was also important for him to demonstrate that the antibody was effective even when used in conjunction with other things um, like uh, steroids here that people are typically treated with um, upon acute episodes of uh, demyelination. And again, what he was able to show was that the antibody was able to promote remyelination, and that remyelination was not inhibited at all by treatment uh, with a steroid as well. So summing up about 15 years of his work in one slide, what he was able to show was that he could promote remyelination in these animal models with a single dose of, um, of the 22 antibody. It was effective at very low doses, 
um, and that it was uh, effective when used in conjunction with steroids, which are typically used during an exacerbation. So in addition to showing uh, anatomically that there was remyelination, it was important to show that this resulted in some benefit for these, these mice. And so what he did was he looked at the overall activity of mice with the disease, which is shown here in, in red, um, and then treated these mice that had the disease with the antibody. And was able to show that after a delay of a couple weeks, there was a significant and sustained enhancement of their uh, overall free activity. Um, so as we started to look at bringing this, this antibody to the clinic, uh, the radiology group at Mayo went on to label uh, the antibody with, with something that could be detected by MR. And what they were able to show is that during the disease state, a significant amount of antibody is able to enter the central nervous system. So then they went on to the next step and said, okay, well, if we can look at antibody in the central nervous system, let's also look using these same MRI studies whether the amount of bad stuff going on in the brain or, of the, or the spinal cords of the mice, the lesions, um, can be reduced by treatment with the antibody. So here are some data from mice that were treated with a control. And the blue bar is the lesion volume before they're treated, and the uh, orange bar is the um, lesion volume after they're treated. And what you see is that in every animal, there's either no change or a slight increase in the total lesion volume within uh, their brain and spinal cord. However, in, all the, in the animals that were treated with the antibody, what you see in the blue bar is the level of lesion volume, or the, the lesion volume before treatment, and the orange bar after treatment. What you see is that there's a um, reduction in the total lesion volume um, and uh, reduced in, in total by about 40% uh, in all the mice that were treated with the 22 antibody. So as you've heard over and over over the, the last day and a half, um, when you lose myelin off neurons, neurons become unhappy and eventually die. And one way to look at the health of neurons is to look at a certain, um, uh, a certain factor known as NAA, which um, um, so this was done by a, another radiologic technique known as spectroscopy. And um, what they were able to do was uh, look at the NAA in mice with disease. And what Moses and the, the group at Mayo was able to show was compared to controls and, and, um, and untreated animals, animals that were treated with the 22 antibody showed a significant enhancement in NAA over several weeks after treatment. Again, really showing that protecting the oligodendrocytes and the myelin had the result of uh, protecting neurons as well. So I'm not going to go into much detail, but they've spent a lot of time looking at the signaling of uh, the antibody. Basically, when the antibody hits the myelin and the oligodendrocytes, how does that signal get to the, to the nucleus or the genes of, of the oligodendrocyte and make the change? Um, and what um, the Mayo, in, uh, in, in conjunction with Accorda, have found over the years is that it's a very complex signaling mechanism which involves both protein and lipid binding. And, uh, and a lot of people call these complexes lipid rafts. And it, if you look at it kind of as a cartoon, what you see is that the combination of the, the binding of lipids and protein results in a certain signal that occurs within the cell, and then that then results in improved myelin production. So we've identified certain components of that antigen. Um, one of those uh, here is the, part of the, uh, the sulfatide. Um, but we haven't defined specifically all parts of that antigen, and that's something that we'd really like to do um, over the next several years. So Moses' group went on to show that if they disrupt the certain parts of that antigen that we do know through things that break up cholesterol or block uh, calcium signaling, he can block the protective effects of the antibody um, in certain uh, cell systems. And here's a slide I'm just going to skip right through, which, but if you're interested, you can look it up. This is a recent publication by the Mayo Group, really looking at all the, the intracellular signaling mechanisms that occur um, after binding. Um, so in total, what they see is that they, they, we know portions of the antigen. Uh, we know how that signal gets through the cell to the nucleus of the, the cell. And then once it's there, what we see in these mice is after treatment, there's an increased amount of synthesis of the genes that are related to making myelin. And that's shown here. So things like myelin basic protein or myelin-associated glycoprotein. So it really gives us some confidence that the behavioral effects, 
the histologic effects, the radiologic effects that we see in these mice is really supported by the science, um, although we certainly would be the first to admit we don't know every step of that pathway. So um, like Ben had described, you know, we went on to uh, start the process of getting to the clinic, um, and that's a, a many-year process you know, involving uh, GMP manufacturing, basically you know, being able to make the antibody so that it's well-characterized uh, and reproducible. Uh, we've done that with uh, contract organizations. Right now, uh, the antibody is in a, a liquid um, preparation, which is infused uh, into, a, into the veins. Um, we completed a significant amount of uh, toxicology and safety in mice and in monkeys. Um, these were done under GLP conditions, obviously, so that they would support uh, filings uh, with the FDA. Um, it's important to mention that these safety trials, these safety and tox studies in animals will continue to, to go on over the next many, many years as uh, the clinical studies go on as well. Um, and uh, we filed a, uh, an IND and it's been cleared by FDA to start the first in human trials uh, with this 22 antibody. Um, so here's the announcement on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, of this trial, and uh, my colleague Andy Eisen is going to tell you more about this study um, that's been going on for the last several months. So, Andy? Good morning. I'm Andy Eisen. I'm the Senior Director of Translational Medicine at Accorda. And I want to thank you, Dr. Greenberg, for inviting us to talk to you about this trial. And I want to thank you and the audience for your interest and willingness to hear about the trial. Because I think as Dr. Greenberg so lucidly stated earlier in his presentation, what applies to other demyelinating diseases such as MS may also apply to transverse myelitis, may apply to NMO, may apply to ADME, and so on and so forth. And as we heard earlier from Dr. Levy and from Dr. Horton, that a drug that was developed and promoted by and marketed by Accorda, Duflamperdine, um, specifically for MS, has been used in an off-label fashion in a couple of clinical trials and seems to show some benefit. And, and so you as a community indeed do benefit from the development of drugs in other fields. And while Accordis initiating the study of the M22 antibody for multiple sclerosis, you could imagine that the pathological processes of demyelination present in MS patients may also be, but not certain, uh, applicable to other conditions, and at some point, perhaps, this drug might be helpful um, elsewhere. I'm going to talk about the phase one trial of M22, which is in progress, and it's about um, uh, several steps into, in, into, its, com into its development. I'm going to go through a little bit of the basic uh, clinical trials. Um, Dr. Reinberg explicitly talked about that. Um, and I'm just going to make one or two little additional comments. I'm going to tell you about the current phase one single ascending dose trial, which is in progress in multiple centers across the United States, and what we're trying to do to learn a little bit more about how this drug works in patients to promote possible remyelination and ultimately, as we hope, improvement in function for patients. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some plans that are germinating and for which Dr. Greenberg has been extremely generous with his time and interest in helping us develop um, and evolving the trial in progress. And then I'm just going to summarize and, and list the sites that are enrolling patients now. So I'm going to give you the take-home message now, um, which is this is a recombinant human-derived antibody of the IgM class that in the experimental models um, is capable of promoting remyelination. And of course, the, uh, the goal and our hope is that this remyelinating effect in the animal models of MS will extend to patients. Um, and it's right now an investigational product, and it's not been approved for commercial use. And it's being studied <laughs> under the guidance and approval of the FDA. Now, as you heard, the primary objective of phase one trials is really to establish the safety and tolerability of this investigational product. And the secondary objectives of the trial are to gain some insight um, into the biological effects of this trial in patients. Now, 
I view my role as a translational medicine physician as, as being responsible for trying to accelerate the rate at which we can study this drug in, in clinical trials and ascertain whether the biological effects are present even as early as phase one. Um, you heard from Dr. Greenberg that typically drugs go through, through, through three phases in, in, the, in the development and approval process. Phase one is typically safety and tolerability. Um, phase two is where you start to gather evidence of efficacy, and phase three is where you try to prove that point to the satisfaction of the FDA so they approve your drug for commercial use and distribution in clinical medicine. Now, these things cost on the order of millions, tens of millions, and hundreds of millions of dollars as you progress from the preclinic to phase one to phase two to phase three. So I view my role in translational medicine as trying to gather as much evidence as early as possible to make the, the bets, essentially, that the pharmaceutical companies are taking to, in the development of this program to say that there's a prob higher probability of success than just simply flipping a coin. And so while phase one had always t typically been just for safety and, and, and tolerability, I think the current modern paradigm in drug development is trying to incorporate uh, measures of efficacy um, or biological effect as early as possible. And so that you can make smarter, smaller, faster phase two trials in design, and they in turn leading to smaller, faster, more economical um, trials in phase three. So the current phase one trial, while I say is principally um, uh, safety and tolerability, um, and we're looking at MS patients, and I've just simply taken this from or, or, or extracted this from our uh, posting on clinicaltrials.gov, is a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-control, randomized, single ascending dose trial. It's a lot, a lot to say. But basically, we're, we're recruiting patients with MS of all varieties to participate in the trial. They'll receive a single infusion of either drug or placebo, and everybody who, who cares for the patients and, and we are blinded to whether they're receiving drug or placebo. And only after the trial is completed, all the data is collected, all the data is locked in place, Will the blind be uh, unblind? Will will we be unblinded and allowed to see and analyze the data to make sure that that the patients who received drug didn't have any more side effects than patients with MS in general might have? There are some obvious inclusions or exclusions, and those are listed on on, on the website. Now, here's the structure of the trial: a patient will come in. Let's see. Does this work? I saw. A patient will come in and will be randomized to receive either placebo or the monoclonal antibody M22. They'll receive the drug, and then throughout the course of time, extending out through 90 days, a, a series of, of evaluations will take place, both clinical, experimental, and investigational, and, you know, and by imaging, by MR and MR spectroscopy because we're trying to gain insight into the biological effects of the drug as well as whether it's simply safe to, to be taken by patients. Now, in the process, we're starting with an extremely low dose, and we're going to successively march higher in the dose to see what is tolerable and safe. And at the center of all of this is a safety steering committee, which will determine, based upon the clinical findings, whether it's safe, whether you can get a green light to move up from level one to level two to level three, four, and five. And the levels that will be examined, we think, are, are, are likely to be extremely safe. Um, what I've listed here is the, f the levels that we're going. They're referenced to what's called the no AEL, that is, where there are no adverse events seen in the preclinical models, in the most sensitive animal model. So based upon the maximal dose where there was no adverse event seen in, in this most sensitive model, which in this case was the monkey, we are starting at a dose that is 1 20th of 1% of that Noel level. So 
we don't believe that, we believe based on the, the findings in the, mal, in the mouse and the monkey models that this drug will be safe to be used in people, but people are not mice, people are not monkeys. And so we start at a very low dose and we successively escalate. And you'll see we're not going very high relative to the maximally safe dose seen in animals. We're still only going up to only 4% of that, that maximally tolerated dose in the animal. But this represents an 80-fold increase in dose as we progress from level one to level two all the way up to level five. Now, you may say, well, are you ever likely to see any biological effect that would indicate that this drug could be potentially effective in the patient population? Well, this dose range actually spans and is many multiples of the effective dose that was actually seen in the mouse model. Now, there's no guarantee that the mouse model is predictive of what will happen in people, but we believe that in spanning this dose range, um, we will cross a region where perhaps we'll see beneficial biological effects, but we simply won't know until the, until the trial is completed, the, the blind is removed, and the data is finally analyzed. But what's important is that at each level, before we progress from the lowest to the highest, there's an evaluation by an, a safety steering committee that includes um, one expert external neuroradiologist who's looking at the, the MRs and the MR spectroscopy from the patients. So this is very typical of phase one single ascending dose trials. There's nothing remarkable or, or magic about this. Um, and hopefully we'll prove that at the conclusion of the trial that it's safe to be used in patients. Now what we're contemplating doing and what we've uh, planned to do or hope to do is, is to modify the trial a little bit with, once we get permission from the FDA to do so. And what we're planning on doing or what we would like to do um, if we receive permission from the FDA, is replace actually the top level of the, do uh, of the trial, which was level six, which was not illustrated on the last slide, but we'll go forward, maybe, oops, I need a little assistance here. Can you, can you advance the slide for me, please? There we go. So, so what we're hoping to do is replace this highest single level dose with a dose with an expanded cohort. Instead of going to a higher dose, to take the highest tested or the highest tolerable dose among those first five levels that are uh, included and do more clinical measures and include some exploratory biomarkers. So some of the things like you heard from Dr. Horton um, earlier, OCT, um, evoke potentials. Those are the sorts of things that we would like to include in, in an expanded cohort so we gain greater insight into whether the drug is having the desired biological effects. You saw from her study and the study from Dr. Levy that 4-AP in, the, in, in TM uh, led to improved neuronal conduction. Well, it would be interesting to see if those same sorts of things occurred um, at the highest tolerable doses of M22. So if we gain approval to do so, one thing we might think about doing is to modify the, the trial so that the last cohort, cohort six, patients will be randomized to one of three options, receiving placebo, <laughs> receiving the drug at the maximally tolerated or the maximally tested dose, and at one dose level below that. Because one of the things, of course, that uh, drug developers are most interested in learning is whether there's any sort of dose-response relationship. That is, do you max out on the benefit at a lower dose, or do you have to keep going up in the dose in order to gain maximal benefit for patients? And so just as before, we'll follow the patients out through time, but we'll extend the period at which we're observing the patients and making assessments of the biological effects out from 90 to twice as long to 180 days, six months. 
patients will still receive only a single dose of investigational agent, whether it's placebo or drug, and we will assess a whole host of parameters that are related to the disposition of the drug in the body, the pharmacokinetics, how much drug is available, how long it stays in the body, um, and how long it has its biological effects through either assessments of blood or other biofluids, um, and by imaging, and by clinical assessments, the typical assessments that are used in the evaluations of patients with MS. So the goals of this expanded cohort would be really threefold. How well does the drug actually get into the central nervous system to affect remyelination if it behaves in the same fashion as it does in the preclinical mouse models? And what biological effects can we measure um, from a single dose? Remember, this is an antibody. Antibodies have been in therapeutic use for decades now. They typically last for weeks to months to many months in the body, and so they have the potential to exert their biological effects for long periods of time. And what we'd like to assess is whether we can see molecular as well as clinical evidence of a, of a beneficial biological effect, such as you heard from Dr. Horton and Dr. Levy on things like conduct, neuro, neuronal conduction speed, or whether it translates into things that are, 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 are more gross measures of, of the neuronal system, such as walking speed, for example, which has been a typical clinical outcome measure for other drugs that have been approved for MS. And why this is important to gain at such an early stage in drug development is because these findings um, may have profound influence on the conduct of subsequent clinical trials. Hopefully they make them faster, smarter, better trials, so it leads to a, a, a more timely approval of an effect, a safe and effective drug. But it's a long haul. So I'm going to summarize and just simply say it's being conducted in patients in MS, but as you've already heard, the same demyelinating conditions that apply in MS may be applicable in, in other conditions. We're going to hopefully expand the last cohort to be able to assess these clinical, biological, and molecular assessments of, of the drugs because we'd like to know who, what, when, where, and how to use this drug to promote remyelination um, in patients with MS and perhaps other demyelinating diseases. And what's really important um, for, for the success for the development of any new drug, as Dr. Greenberg mentioned earlier, is the fact that you are interested and enthusiastic and committed patients who participate in trials. And for that, we really thank you. And I'm going to leave with a, a final slide which indicates the sites that are currently recruiting patients. This is posted on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, lists the site, the location, and the principal investigator, um, while it's not applicable for TM or NMO at the moment, um, your, 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 your friends with MS um, are being very courageous by participating in this study, and hopefully they'll help advance this drug if it proves to be safe and effective. Thank you. Thank you.